Well, grace and peace to you all from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. In the popular 1995 crime film, The Usual Suspects, one character in that film is secretly quite evil. And later, when he reveals himself as who he really is, something this man had said earlier in the movie about the devil seemed to apply to him as well. He had said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Now, just as many today do not believe there is, exists a personification of pure good, a creator God, so many today also do not believe there exists a personification of evil, Satan. In the famous Agatha Christie novel, And Then There Were None, ten people find themselves in an isolated location where one by one they are murdered. Well, it turns out that the terrible person behind it all was someone who was already considered murdered. I guess it's easier to commit murder if people think you don't exist or you're no longer living. A big lie led to others to believe that that man was dead, which reminds me of what Jesus called the devil, the father of lies. Now, all the writers of the New Testament not only believed in the existence of Satan, the devil, they often cautioned us about how to avoid Satan's wily schemes. The apostle who wrote our first lesson today, James, mentioned the devil directly in his letter twice, but indirectly many times. In chapter 3 of his letter, James mentions two kinds of wisdom, godly wisdom and a devilish wisdom. How can there be devilish wisdom? Well, I guess wisdom, a good thing, can become devilish and be a bad thing. We read in God's word that the devil likes to masquerade as an angel, of, an angel of light. Somebody who is pro-religion. Someone who is all about being right, being perfect. And especially being a success in the world. Now, the fleshy side of us human beings is ambitious for success and and James, led by the Spirit, tells us to beware of such ambition. The good works that are devilish, James states, come from a boastful person, someone who is filled with envy and selfish ambition. What is the other more godly kind of ambition, you may ask? Well, James tells us. He says that it's those who show the gentleness born of wisdom, those who are peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, and without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. Now, acting like this, we foil the devil's plans. We are called not to be grandiose, strutting in our self-satisfied righteousness. No, no, no. That's playing the devil's game. Jesus, when tempted by Satan to, to dive one of the three temptations, to die from the top of the temple so that God would send angels to save him before he hit the ground. Well, Jesus refused Satan's offer. He refused to be grandiose and test the Father's love for him. Today, James lists a number of ways we can get the devil's goat. Be generous, James advises you and me. For such generosity is from above. He says, coming down from the Father of lights, James calms us and tells us today, be quick to listen, slow to speak. How often do we act like we would rather get our word in in a conversation than take the time to listen to what others are saying? I know I do that. The devil again wants us to grandstand, to dominate conversations, to show how much we know so that we can feed the pride within us that Jesus warns about in our gospel today. Now, James warns us, warns us today also to be slow to anger. Why? Well, this is the thing. It's not that anger itself is totally bad. It's how and when we use anger. As with Paul in his philosophy, so with James. Oftentimes, it's when we are displaying our own anger that kind of anger that we feel when we feel self-righteous 
The kind of anger that the devil knows makes us feel so good at the time we express it. That's the anger that gets us into trouble. Remember, we are not called by God to be right in our own eyes. That is often a selfish endeavor. We are called to to do God's will, not our own will. And James says being angry with others often is counterproductive. And anger that is, as he put it, does not produce God's righteousness. Now to our fleshy ears, what James wants us to substitute for anger seems ridiculous. James calls on us instead to be meek. Meek. James calls us to meekly receive into our hearts the implanted word of God, who is Jesus Christ. We are to let Jesus in, to let Jesus take over our lives and lead us not only to eternal salvation, which is so important, but also to leaving leaving behind a saved life in all that we say and do here on earth. A saved life, the kind of life where God gets us to open our hearts to be generous to others, opens our hands to be generous to others. For after all, we were created to be as generous as our generous God. What's neat is that in the passage we just heard Mary read, James outlines more clearly than most authors in the Bible the main reason why God created each one of us. James wrote today, in fulfillment of God's own purpose, God gave us birth by the word of truth. Why? What purpose? James says, so that we, you and I, would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Being a point of light sent from the Father of lights to light up the lives of others with love. And James is so right about that. Now, that was God's idea for making humanity. He's the God of love. And he wanted children like us to bring more loving service into his world. But right away, after creating us in the Garden of Eden, the devil sought to derail and ruin that very purpose God had for us. Masquerading as the serpent, Satan said to Eve and to Adam that that God was a liar, a liar about eating the forbidden fruit. You will not die, he said, if you eat the forbidden fruit. Satan then charged God with being jealous and afraid of the two of them. God knows, he told Adam and Eve, that when you eat of it, the forbidden fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. As Martin Luther knew, it's distrust and doubts about God that get us in trouble with the devil. Luther once said, if the Lord appoints anything to happen to us, whether it is good or bad, (laughs) or bad, and brings us either shame or honor, prosperity or adversity, well then I as a Christian am to consider what happened, even the bad things, as not only good, but actually sacred events in my life. Wow. Luther says, as a Christian, I am to say this is a pure and precious blessing. I am not worthy to have it touch me. That's why, Luther adds, we read in Psalm 145, verse 17, the Lord is righteous in all God's ways and holy in all God's works. And that, my friends, is a full faith. Some of the Jews at the time of the destruction of their country and temple by the Babylonians, at the time of their exile to Babylon, which followed, some Jews were so touched by such a full faith in God after this horrible thing that happened, that somehow the loss of everything was something they saw as a holy blessing. And in a a way, it came to be that way. Because as a result... The Jews learned their Bible a lot better in Babylon. And their faith, in turn, led them to be the only people in ancient times that I know of who completely lost their country and yet came back years later to found Israel all over again. But it's the devil's plan to get us to doubt, to doubt that God is really guiding us even in the bad times. Are we going through bad times today? Mm Mm-hmm. Luther also wrote, but those who complain that an injustice is being done by, to them by God and say that God is therefore asleep or 
If they charge God with all that, they dishonor God, Luther says, and consider God neither just nor holy. Luther said, but the Christian should attribute justice to God and the injustice to himself or herself or ourselves. This kind of thought keeps devilish thoughts about God at bay. Knowing and believing that God is always there for us and every day for us, and that he every day leads and guides us, helps us to persevere. Persevere. James tells us today, look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, which is how God frees us from worry. And he urges, therefore persevere. Persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act. He adds that we will be blessed in our doing the Lord's will. Yes, the devil will win a few rounds. But you and I, we are called to keep going, to persevere in our service to the Lord. Later, James describes the benefit of perseverance. Keep submitting yourselves to God, he says. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. You see, the devil is tricky, yes, but he is not all-powerful like God is. Satan's all smoke and mirrors. And what phrase does James use to sum up what it means to submit ourselves to God? He uses this phrase, caring for orphans and widows. He describes living out the Christian life, and in the process, thumbing our nose at the devil, As a life, devoting oneself to helping those who are helpless. Caring for orphans and widows and anyone else who needs our physical and spiritual help in this day and age. Of course, that means engaging with a world that is messy. A world that is risky. A world that is sometimes bleak. Bleak. You know, when Jesus first told the twelve that he was going to Jerusalem to be rejected and die on a cross... Peter rebuked him, saying to Jesus, don't go. Then Jesus replied to Peter, get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on God's plan, but on human plans. Right after that, Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop. And then Peter desperately suggested that this shining Jesus stay up on that mountain and avoid death, avoid going down to the capital city in death. But Jesus again knew that what Peter said was another scheme of Satan's. Ignored Peter's plan and went back down that mountain. We too are called to deny our plans. To take up the cross Jesus gives us and follow him down from our mountain of comfort to fulfill God's call to serve below. As Luther once cried out, (laughs) To be in the kingdom of God on earth is to be in the midst of difficulties. The person who will not suffer this, he said, does not want to be of the kingdom of Christ. He wants to be just among friends, to sit only among roses and lilies. Not with supposedly bad people, but to sit with only the supposedly devout people. Part of Christ's comments in our gospel today on how things outside us don't defile us, is not just a comment on foods, on foods not defiling us, but also a comment on how people out there are unable to to defile you and me. Jesus was charged by his enemies with being defiled by who he hung out with. But he ignored the critics and went on serving even the downtrodden. We too should be less focused on how others can bring us down and more focused on how we have the ability to lift them up. One last thing about Satan. Besides tricking others into believing he doesn't exist, the other big trick of his is getting us to believe we are not saved by God's grace, the grace found in Jesus Christ. You know, in Hebrew, the word Satan means accuser. It's Satan, Satan, who amplifies that inner voice inside of you and me that says, well, you can't do God's will. Don't even try. You're a failure. You're a hypocrite. You're an out-and-out sinner. 
But Luther has a response to this final trick played from the devil's hand. He says, So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell, but what of it? For I know someone with a capital S who suffered and died on my behalf. And his name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. My friends, that's why Luther laughed at the devil and kept doing God's will. Let's also laugh at the devil. Let's do the same. Amen. Oh,